Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Simply Bitcoin IRL. Uh, I'm very, very excited about this episode. Uh, we have a very special guest. His name is Alejandro. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask him to pronounce his last name because it's it's uh, it's quite difficult for me to pronounce it. Uh, but he is the national security advisor of the country of El Salvador. So I have a ton of questions for him. Really looking forward to this episode. But before we jump in, I want to give a shout out to the Bitcoin company that makes this show possible. Swan Bitcoin is the best place to buy Bitcoin. It's built by Bitcoiners. It's for Bitcoiners. Set up a DCA plan, set it to forget. Also check out their new product, Swan IRA. They have they have uh, Roth, they have everything. And if you uh, if you have any questions, uh, Roth, I, I, forgive me for that. If you have any questions about the Swan IRA, you can always hit me up on Twitter or the Orange Pill app. But no more delay. I want to bring up our guest, Alejandro. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. And I com- and I sincerely apologize for not being able to pronounce your last name. So. Uh, if you don't mind, how do you say it? Well, my, my last name is uh, from Oost Flanderen, Belgium, and it is pronounced Merschkont. Merschkont. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, El Salvador has been on the news a lot, hasn't it? Um, so... Could you tell everybody what your role is? So you are the national security advisor. You know, what what does that entail? Well, uh, it's the same role as the national security advisor of the United States, but without the United States budget. So, yeah, it's kind of difficult. Um, um, At the beginning, it was an impossible thing to do to get rid of of organized crime and, and terrorist organizations. Uh, so mainly I'm a, an advisor to the president. And what is it, and what is it that, you know, what, again, because a lot of people are not familiar with that, right? So like, what, are, what are the responsibilities of the national, of, of a national security advisor? Well, uh, some things cannot be said on air. The things that you uh, can say. Well, uh, one find the best uh, response to the actual uh, situation to tackle uh, organized crime organization. And there's another role that we we don't have that problem to uh, have a knowledge uh, of foreign 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 actors that want to uh, do damage to a country. Yeah. And there's definitely plenty of those uh, lately. Right. You we have the legacy corporate media, propaganda media, you know, trying to go out, uh, trying to tarnish the name of El Salvador, trying to tarnish the the Bitcoin law. Uh, Also, you had a recent law or some senators in the United States, uh, you know, are trying to pass a law in in Congress that would be investigating El Salvador's Bitcoin adoption. Clearly, uh, the fact that El Salvador adopted Bitcoin or made Bitcoin legal tender is uh, is definitely spooking a, a, a lot of people, specifically, you know, the political class, the elite political class, at least in the United States, they get a tremendous amount of power. Uh, from being able to create money for free that everyone else has to work for, and not to mention, not to mention, uh, also weaponizing uh, that currency, you know, through sanctions, right? And also using the IMF for political, uh, for political means as well, right? So, are, are those are those all things that are on your radar? Uh, media, it's not on my radar. Uh, uh, sanctions by IMF and other uh, agencies, yes. That is one of the reasons that Bitcoin was adopted uh, in every po- podcast that I've been invited to uh, shows like this. Uh, I orange built the Bukeles in 2018. Uh, back then, there was no Lightning Network. So we were being ghosted by two big political parties. We didn't, could not receive funds. So I came up with the idea. I've been in Bitcoin since uh, uh, 2012. And I went to talk to one of uh, the president's brother, Karim, and said, uh, we need Bitcoin. So I explained what was blockchain and Bitcoin. That, that's a long story. Um, but when uh, Bitcoin became legal tender, mainly it, it was 
because money uh, USD is weaponized. So in, a, in case of any followed by IMF or any other big organizations, we had something uh, to bypass uh, the SWIFT system. And our GDP uh, relies 30% uh, um, on remittances. So they could tackle us uh, either way uh, via taking out of, uh, us out of the SWIFT system or uh, taxing the hell out of the, the remittance money. Uh, and either way, we would be, we would be uh, greatly affected. So to me, at least, at least that, that was uh, the, the proposal for Bitcoin. Yeah, and, and let me ask you something. This is very interesting, right? Why was Naim Bukele open to Bitcoin? Why was he open to the idea of making Bitcoin legal tender? Why did he jump on that? Well, he, he's a very smart guy. Uh, he likes technology. So uh, I'm really not in the president's head, but uh, yeah, he saw the benefits of having Bitcoin as legal tender. Yeah. And what what have those benefits been uh, so far? So Bitcoin has been legal tender for about a year in El Salvador. Um, you, I'm assuming you're on the ground over there. Uh, what have you seen? Well, uh, in September 7th, uh, 2021, Bitcoin law came in effect. Uh, at the beginning, it was a little bit chaotic because we had to develop an, an app. Uh, and that app was developed in 90 days. So there was no alpha testing, stress testing, or any kind of testing. So when it was released, uh, it was hell. <laughs> uh, everyone wanted that those $30. So people downloaded the app. And in the first uh, four hours, we had four, 4 million downloads. Seems like we lost Alejandro. I'm assuming he'll be back in a second. I'm going to bring up Opti in the meantime. What's up, Opti? Well, <clears throat> interesting, interesting place to stop. It was just getting heated. It was, it was just, it was just getting exciting. Uh, hopefully, Alejandro. Oh, there we go. He's back. He's back. All right, Alejandro, could you hear us? Yes. Okay, awesome. Uh, seems like you dropped out for a sec, but you, the last thing that you were mentioning was the uh, the effect about how everyone wanted the thirty dollars. That it was a little bit difficult rolling out the the Chivo app application in the beginning. Uh, so yeah, yes, everybody everybody wanted those thirty dollars, even if they were were not Bitcoiners, and, and then some people with with. with uh with malicious intent, uh, started cloning uh, our national ID and they were getting accounts with uh, real national IDs for people that uh, didn't even log to Chivo. And when they logged into Chivo, they saw that their $30 were gone. So uh, yeah, we, we started an investigation uh, and many of those were caught and now are facing jail time uh, for fraud. And uh, well, what Bitcoin has done to our country is, uh, firstly, uh, it has given us a spotlight. And secondly, uh, well, uh, people are coming to El Salvador and uh, 30, year, 30 years back in time, I, I wouldn't have imagined uh, of people from the US, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Netherlands, France and many other countries have come to to this country to get their, their residency. It, it was the, the other way around. So that is good. But in order to have that ready for the people, uh, security had to be fixed because we couldn't have the pro, uh, those people, that flow of people coming in with the insecurity we had. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I want to I want to talk about that. So 
and and I think that's misunderstood at least in the U.S. So I'm I'm you know I I, I live in Miami. I'm originally from uh, Venezuela. Uh, I've spent uh, I've lived in in Colombia. I lived in La República Dominicana. So I understand Central and South America. Tú eres un chamo. Soy un chamo. Soy soy tu pana. <laughs> <laughs> eh, um, but I understand. But a, a lot of the the narratives that we hear that the anti Bukele narratives personally, as you know, as someone who understands central, uh, central and South America. Um, I think what Naim Bukele is doing is, is, is amazing. I, I think that, you know, he, he's cleaned up crime. It, it's never been done before. Uh, most governments are just so corrupt. Uh, you know, what, what Chavez and then Maduro did to Venezuela is just a total atrocity. Not to mention the murder rate, you know, the capital flight, the brain drain, all of that stuff. Um, but again, that's my personal opinion. Some people are, are talking about, uh, you know, the violation of, of human rights. My opinion is, why should gang members that kill people have, you know, why, why is that a priority off of people that are just peaceful and stuff like that? So what would you, I guess my question to you, Alejandro, is, how bad was it before the security? Uh, how bad was it in El Salvador? How bad was the, the situation on the ground in El Salvador before Naim Bukele started uh, locking things down? And, and we'll, we'll go from there. Well, we had uh, a murder uh, rate that was 106 uh, homicides per capita. And now we have uh, a murder rate of 6.5 per capita. So we have taken down that a lot. We have tackled that. And we have become, we're, we come from being the most dangerous country in the world to becoming one of the safest in Latin America. Uh, when we arrived at the government, there's an index that Vision of Humanity provides. It's not an index that, that we manage. Yeah, we do have a formula in order uh, for us to, to have that bef before, uh, uh, it is uh, posted by them, so we can measure our numbers with theirs, and that's called the economic cost of violence, and it's an index that is compared to in percent to the GDP of the country. Uh, our country is really small; it's twenty thousand kilometers squared, and with a GDP of twenty-seven billion dollars. And when we got into the government, the economic cost of violence index was twenty-seven percent. Uh, then uh, we didn't have representation in the Congress, so we didn't have any uh, loans for security. Uh, we needed to implement uh, lots of stuff. Uh, at the beginning, what we were uh, we got a police force with uh, 30, 30 year old guns that wouldn't even work. So the policeman was just having the gun, and that gun couldn't shoot. So we started from the bottom up. Uh, we modernized the police. Uh, we, we, we gave them uh, six hours. I'm a big six hour fan, so six hours is what, what, they, what they got. And uh, secondly, our military was puny military force. In fact, uh, if, 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 if it, wasn't going to be taken care of. The best thing that could have been done is to eliminate the, eliminate the military force and become like Costa Rica. But uh, one of the things we wanted is to keep our uh, sovereign, sovereignty, uh, sovereignty. Sovereignty, yeah. Yeah, so, sovereignty, yeah. So in order to have that, we, we, we're not a country that will invade other countries. But we, we believe in our self-determination and self-defense. So we needed to beef up uh, the military force. So uh, from 1600, it was uh, taken to 40,000. No, six, yeah, 40,000. And we had to give them a web, uh, new weapons as well, uh, new technologies, uh, new tools for, for fighting uh, crime uh, among the the police force, uh, because in the past governments, the, the military was just uh, there. 
Why, why didn't past governments care about the crime? It was a big business. Um, we had two primary gangs here, uh, the Barrio 18, which is a Mexican gang created in Los Angeles. And we had, uh, the, we have the, the MS-13 created in Los Angeles by ex-guerrillas and ex-militaries from El Salvador to protect against the 18 gang. Uh, in the Clinton era, those gang gang members were being uh, deported to our country. So they came here, started organizing. And at that time in the 90s, we were being governed by the Republican Party called ARENA. And they, they saw that they could benefit economically from crime. So most of the people uh, that were in, in the government from ARENA, they started uh, private security firms and what the state cannot supply yeah the, the private security firms uh, did but things got got out of hand at, the, at that time in let's say 1995 you could squash the 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 gang members in in months so let they let that grow and there was a, a an accord when pablo escobar died uh, I, I think he he committed suicide but yeah uh when pablo escobar di dies the mexican cartels get uh, get an agreement with the with the colombian cartels and say that that uh, they establish that if someone is transporting drugs that they will not be paid in cash so they keep a percentage of what they're trafficking so narco was here and another uh, Latin American countries, we have the disadvantage of being uh, uh, in the middle of South America and North America, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, cocaine buyers. So we are like a bridge uh, to get there. Uh, so the narcos here, since they could not pay, let's say, in half a kilo or ounces, uh, they needed uh, a structure to do uh, the narco stuff, uh, to sell uh, grams. Uh, so they used the gang members. So they gave the gang members money. And one of my hypotheses in, in my upcoming book is that every organized crime organization or terrorist organization is in size equivalent to the finances that, that they manage so if they if they have enough money uh, they can expand like any company and they became an international uh, terrorist organization and now they they didn't need the narcos yeah they, they, they still uh, did the biddings for for selling ounces and all that but they became uh, traffickers not only uh, drug traffickers but uh, human traffickers uh, weapons traffickers and all other illegal uh, activities that you can imagine so they became really big uh, and if you have an organization that big you need a lot of cash to to keep it up as an upkeep uh, so, uh, in my hypo hypothesis, was if you go and tackle the funds, they they will at some point uh, have to collapse or at least uh, cut spending and uh, diminish in size. Yeah, and and I and okay, so clearly there was a problem. Clearly the previous administrations of the previous political parties, there's the left wing party and there's a the right wing party. I think you mentioned the right wing party, which is arena. Um, both of them, regardless of who was in power would actually be uh, cooperating with the, or uh, better said uh, economically benefiting from the gangs. What would be the human toll on society? Well, uh, we had a, a civil war that lasted 12 years. From 1980 to 1992, then the the fall uh, peace accords came, and the conflict we we lost uh, 
75,000 lives. And uh, in the post era, that, has, that doubled in, in, in numbers. Uh, so so you're, guy, saying, you're saying post the Civil War, the amount of deaths due to gang violence doubled? Yes, you had days which uh, the murder rate was 100 mur murders uh, on a daily basis. And who and were these gang on was this gang on gang violence or would this spill into there, there was gang on gang, gang violence, but mainly on citizens. So what would your response be to a lot of these Western publications that, first of all, they're not Hispanic, they, they don't live, they're not based in Central America, they're not based in Latin America. But let's say these, you know, Western people that, you know, to borrow from Alex Gladstein's book, benefit from financial privilege and their, you know, opinion on this matter is, you know, uh, it, even though Naim Bukele clearly has brought down the murder rate, clearly is saving the lives of, you know, hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, if not tens of thousands of people, what would your response be to them? And, and there's also, you know, a lot of the criticism has come from the legacy corporate media that is clearly on the side of fiat. Clearly, it's not on the side of Bitcoin. What would be your response to them? as a local, as someone who lives in El Salvador? Well, uh, finishing the economic uh, cost of violence uh, issue, uh, in 2012, we, we closed uh, with the economic cost of violence of 14%, still unacceptable. Uh, my goal is to take down that to 6%, uh, being that we, we took out 13% of of what the organized crime was uh, receiving in money, uh, those are three point four billion dollars that now are going to the to the regular economy, not the criminal enterprise. So, in my hypothesis, I was right. If you tackle the funds, uh, they will have to to cut spending and increase their size. Uh, decreasing their size. Uh, also helps us. Uh, they they fight among amongst each other for leadership, leadership. So uh, sometimes they 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 give out intel on their on their own people to get the leadership, and that has worked well. <laughs> okay, so clearly, and then so, and, and I'm very curious about this, right? So. You, you mentioned the economic cost of, 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 crim of crime, right? Could you define cost of violence. economic cost of violence? Could you define what that is for anyone who's not familiar with that term? Well, the economic cost of violence is what the crimes and, and violent crimes cost the state and what the state is losing in, in money. In revenue. So you can go to visionofhumanity.org and you can further study the, the economic cost of violence. Don't take it as face for as face value. Uh, for what I say, you can research your own and see how we're doing there. And um, going back to um, when the gang members and organizations uh, became big, uh, they had enough muscle to negotiate with the government. So they sat with the government and they started uh, a truce. So in that truce, uh, they extorted the uh, government. So the government started paying them in order to reduce crime. So there was like this valve. We let you kill 20 people on a daily basis. Uh, don't go more than that. And that was unacceptable, in my opinion. And I think most of you people will coincide with what I'm saying. Um, the other thing is when the government did not pay up, uh, like in GTA five, they started well, GTA three, we, we, they, they did rampage and they started killing everyone that got in front, in front of them. So, uh, one of the records was a hundred and something people uh, being killed on, on the same day. Uh, you had uh, public transportation buses being burned down by the gang members with the whole passengers inside being uh, 
turn it live. And this, okay, and this was, and I mean, that's a very powerful statement, right? So there was buses being literally set on fire with people inside alive, uh, 100 people dying a day. Now, what a, what a lot of people would say is, you know, it, it, what 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 was the cost of reducing the violence? The cost of reducing the violence was uh, was increasing power to the state. Um, what would your response be to that? Well, if you defund organized crime or organized uh, terrorist organizations, you def you defund the organization, the state will rise because. It will have more money uh, taxing and uh, let's say uh, we have uh, a sales tax as well so if that goes up the other goes down yeah and so and then one of the other concerns is basically that the rise of the power of the state uh, if you know, if you look at historical context, right, could potentially be used on its own citizens. Uh, that, that, that's a complicated matter. Uh, I'm not not a big fan of a, a big state, uh, but in this case, it, it had to be done because it was unbearable, and you had migration crisis, and you had lots of people going to the state uh, illegally. And uh, mainly, they, they, they didn't go by plane. Some did. They just got their visa and overstayed. Um, most went from on foot from here to Guatemala, Guatemala, Mexico, to Ciudad Juarez or any other uh, um, frontier point that, that, that you had with the US. And people there got raped. They got killed. They got kidnapped. They got uh, extortion. So people were uh, uh, willing to go there in order to escape this country. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, and and I, and I want to focus on the part that it needed to be done. Now, I I tend my personal opinion is I completely agree with that. Um, most of, most of, you know, Colombia is a little bit safer nowadays. Venezuela is total shit show. Uh, parts of Mexico, especially, specifically the U S Mexican border, you know, complete it's, it's anarchy. Basically it's run by gangs. Not to no, mention no, no, like, no, no, that's not anarchy. Uh, according to Murray Rothbard, anarchy is, what would you uh, define it as? That's chaos. That's not anarchy. That's anarchy chaos. Is, is, is each doing his own without bothering anyone. That's chaos. Um, and, you know, obviously in the, what you guys did there, you stepped in, you, you were talking about it earlier. You know, you, you funded the military, you funded the police forces that dramatically decreased crime. Um, why do you think all these international publications were so focused on El Salvador while, you know, there's basically, basically, you know, the war is happening in Ukraine. There's a lot more other violent countries in, in the world. Why were they so hell bent on focusing on Naim Bukele and his administration in, from your perspective? Well, uh, if you go to data, uh, and you see the officers involved shooting in the U.S. It's a double standard that the U.S. is questioning what we're doing because what has been done has been done surgically with gloves and all because we have declared a war on criminality and terrorism and we're not shooting the hell out of the people. In some cases, yes, there's been an uh, officer involved shooting, but laws here are different. Uh, here you have to wait upon, uh, upon being fired to return fire, not like the U.S. that the police uh, fires upon you and the, then ask what you were doing. Uh, so we, 
sadly we we have had some officers down and we have had some terrorists down but we have managed to tackle uh, about 69k uh, gang members uh you say 69,000 gang members have yes. been arrested yes and or killed see, no, no, no 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 arrested arrested yeah uh, killed is less than 20 and yeah. officers uh down less than 10. still how, wait how were you able to round up 69,000 people without violence well Mo uh, the money the money that you were talking about earlier right yeah you have to take out the money and intelligence here plays a, a really important part so in order to do this surgically uh, and precise you need intelligence good intel and you need uh oh i can't tell more than you about that but you get my point uh the other thing uh just to, to have that clear in in case uh this podcast get, gets to hrw or alice gladstein we're not waterboarding people we're not torturing people to get out and tell that is uh in my opinion that that's shitty intel that's uh what people tell you what you want to hear and that that's not real intel uh, there are other ways to get intel and this is not gitmo we don't have gitmo and if the us wants these terrorism terrorists we can gladly ship them to gitmo if they want to that's not a problem they, they, for us, it's better for the U.S. to have them in Gitmo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and that that thing of double standards, I I completely agree. Um, I remember, uh, you know, at least in the U.S., uh, you had the you have the current uh, political front runner of the opposing party. He was just indicted in New York City. Uh, I do not see that happening in El Salvador. No. Um, and it's not being talked about by the legacy corporate media. So there is this type of double standard. Um, and, and again, I think this the U.S. has taken this, uh, you know, holier than thou stance for quite a while now. Uh, does that frustrate you at all? I know that, you know, the, the corporate media doesn't have as much control as it once had. I think it's lost a tremendous amount of its legitimacy, and I think it loses more of its legitimacy every single day. Um, but does that is that something from a national security perspective that you take into account? Yeah, we take that into account. But there's a this um, Canadian uh, truck driver. He wrote DJ. a book. DJ Dichter. He's yeah. the man. Yes. He said. He, he said. That, he said that the. The media is not being paid for you to to present news. It is paid to shove a political agenda. So you have to be careful with the media, and you have, uh, those narratives. Yes, definitely affect us because they, uh, some of those media outlets still have credibility. Uh, some are, are losing their 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 credibility, and that's one of them is CNN and uh, well, you cannot be CNN and Fox News all the time you, you you need to do your own research on what they're telling you because they will tell you the opposite of everything so in between of those opposites the, the, there lies the truth yeah. yeah and speaking of Fox right you had the most popular broadcaster uh, on Fox, 3.5, Tucker Carlson, had Naim Bukele not only on Tucker Carlson tonight, but also on Tucker Carlson today. And he was going against a lot of those mainstream media narratives, and they fired him. And what happened to Tucker Carlson? And they got rid of him. They got rid of him. And it reminds me of an article that Naim, Naim Bukele wrote, or President Naim Bukele wrote for Bitcoin Magazine. Um, stop, stop drinking the, uh, the, the elite Kool-Aid. Correct. Where he says that their most important tool is their control. Their most important weapon is their control on truth. Right. Uh, but I think that the Internet is slowly breaking that. I think that their ability to control the narrative when people could just go seek out their, their own information 
It's not the news world that our grandparents or our parents were raised in. Uh, you can pick up a phone. You can go to YouTube. You can go to Rumble. You can go to Noster. You can go to Twitter. Yeah, but back then, the agenda was not that harsh like it is now. Do you think so? Let me ask you something. Is it is it because is it because the agenda wasn't so harsh or is it because people were not aware? Because I do remember in 2003, they sold the American public on uh, Iraq having having uh, having weapons of mass destruction. And I saw a tweet by Jack Posobiec and it was a very powerful tweet. He said, if social media existed in 2003, the United States would not have gone to war with Iraq. The, the, the sad thing there is that war. Uh, is beneficial to uh, countries like the U.S. with a military-industrial complex, and war uh, also serves a purpose of laundering money. And everything is they're fighting out there for you to enjoy your freedom, and that's a big fat lie. It's a freaking lie, man. That's a freaking. And does that does that worry you? Right? The you know the the military industrial complex some people call it the deep state i don't call it the deep state because it's uh it's right up in your grill these days i call it the administrative state that benefits tremendously uh from being from the money printer from the u.s being able to issue its own currency the u.s is allowed to deficit spend every year then they divide and conquer the populace through uh, democrat republican culture war all of that stuff benefits the elites um Obviously, that system that is completely dependent on the wealth redistribution mechanism of inflation, right? That this money printing is going to fight tooth and nail uh, to to be able to maintain that privilege as if their life depended on it, because I think their life has depended on it, has dep uh, does depend on it. We have RFK Jr., whose father was arguably assassinated by the CIA now second in uh, the Democratic primary, who is not even being allowed to debate, uh, you know, uh, Joe Biden. Um, so clearly, you know, the administrative state, the deep state, the military industrial complex, clearly they're putting up a fight. Clearly they don't want detractors. This is why Tucker Carlson was let go, right? Yes. This is why they don't want RFK Jr. debating uh, Joe Biden. You know, you could say this, uh, I don't want to get down that rabbit hole, but you could say this is part of the reasons why uh, Trump was indicted, right? Um, I, I am not a, a, a big Trump fan, but yeah, he was indicted for that. I, yeah. I do admire Ron Paul and Rand Paul. Um, if you uh, followed uh, closely, the Afghanistan war was over, then they... They shoved us the COVID pandemic, and now we have the Ukraine war. Uh, I don't, uh, I, I don't agree with what Russia is doing in Ukraine, uh, but Zelensky is a, a NATO puppet, and those weapons are some of that weapons are ending up in Latin America. Yeah. So that's a big problem. Yeah. And so I, I, I guess I guess where I was going with this, right? And I, again, a lot of these topics that I just brought up, I understand that they are not uh in you know in, in you know just political science the term the the concept the Overton window, I understand that they could be seen as radical or conspiracy or whatever, whatever. But just for the sake of this conversation, we know that the military industrial complex is real. Um I forget the president, it was Eisenhower that warned about it in his uh, farewell uh, address. So we know it's real. We know it benefits from uh, the money printer. Assange was li is literally locked away, you know, throw away the key for kind of exposing some of the some of the crimes that happened in the war in Iraq. Um, so we know all of this. Does that worry you that that system is going to fight? Uh, they're going to fight like their life depends on it. Does that worry you at all? No. Uh, what worries me is, yeah, the, the printer going brr all the time. That's depth, depth gone. Uh, the 
purchase uh, power of the dollar is declining each day and not so many people get bitcoin uh, because at some point here in this country uh chivo yes was was a shitty uh product but uh, they associated bitcoin with chivo so they they thought chivo is bitcoin and bitcoin is chivo and some of the opposition uh, don't like bitcoin even if uh, if you show them the, the benefits because uh it's a bukele idea so uh the, 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 there are misconceptions here that, that need to be fight fought um so what worries me uh when there's a war on, on a large scale like the one in ukraine is going is that those weapons eventually will end up in latin america and if they get into mexico they will get into our country and we've been dismantling between five and six uh illegal encampments uh terrorist encampments uh, on a daily basis and we have seized uh, c4 and homebrew uh remote controls to detonate the c4 uh and some weapons that are not uh, military issued by us or honduras or Guatemala, nicaragua and are brand new so when you see brand new weapons uh, in the hands of terrorists that is narco yeah and have they but they haven't used those weapons those weapons of war really uh against the the populace yet there hasn't been any type of revenge seeking from you know these ex gang leaders and gang members oh intel says that they want revenge gotcha. but without money like i said my hypothesis without money it's kind of difficult what would you say to the, you know, what some of the narratives by whether it is in Europe, uh, the European Central Bank, it's some some members of government here in the U.S., the Financial Action Task Force is unelected bureaucracy, um, basically gets to dictate the world rules of finance. Um, what would you say that Bitcoin, what would you say to them when they say Bitcoin is going to be used for terrorism or money laundering? uh what would your response to that be well most of the money seized here and i'd say 99.99 percent are greenbacks they're us dollars and the other percent left have has been the euros it has not been bitcoin no not even monero <laughs> uh, why 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 don't they like why don't they like bitcoin why don't these criminals or why don't these terrorists these gang members these criminals why don't they like bitcoin well on chain bitcoin has lots of traceability and they are stupid very stupid not sophisticated and uh, let's say i was not on this side but on the other side i would be advising yeah let's move money through lightning network definitely <laughs> and let's coin join and let's do whatever it's needed uh to make it untraceable uh, but they don't think that way they like having la caletas you know what caleta means so they have their stash of money in in houses or in barrels in, in, in their backyard and uh, we have not seized any hardware wallet or <laughs> any phone with uh, wallet of Satoshi. <laughs> so, so they they like U.S. dollars, but you know, and clearly, you know, they're not sophisticated. You know, uh, they're not sophisticated enough to really understand this. Do you think that they will ever reach a day where you know they start to understand? They're like, oh, you know what, this this Bitcoin thing, writing down twenty four words is a lot easier than having a whole barrel full of cash. Do you think that day will ever arrive? Well, there is no small enemy, so you cannot uh, belittle any organization. Maybe uh, they can change their modus operandi at some point and go Bitcoin. But uh, what I've seen so far and since Pablo Escobar and before Pablo Escobar, uh, narcos and organized crime like 
having their USD, even if they have to to take them out of the barrels and dry them out in the sun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's still said that in, in Colombia, there's still barrels buried under the ground with millions upon millions of dollars and no one has found yet. Yes. So anyways, very, very interesting conversation. So uh, Naim Bukele's election is coming up 2024, uh, coincidentally, the year of the Bitcoin halving. Um, from a national security standpoint, I think that uh, without without being specific on any countries, uh, there was there would be a lot of countries that would benefit from Naim Bukele being defeated in an election. And I'm sure that the opposing parties are being propped up by those said countries that would benefit in a Naim Bukele defeat. Um, what are you guys doing to deal with that as much as that you could as much as you could say? I plead the fifth on that. I plead the fifth on that. Let, but let me ask you this then. Um, is that happening or am I dreaming of things? It's a scenario, a possible scenario. It's a possible scenario. Cl close. <laughs> good enough answer. <laughs> um, the, the, the thing is, uh, in, in the past, when I started exposing corruption and, and the gang truth, uh, my head had a, a price on it. So I had many attempts on my life. Uh, sadly, one of them, uh, I was shot in the leg and in, in the thigh and the bullet uh, ripped through the femur and that that day if i didn't, didn't defend myself I, I would have been killed so that was el salvador back then and they realized uh, i was not that easy to kill so they started lawfaring me so they wanted me in jail at all costs so clearing the path for Najib bukele project was not that easy yeah, yeah. I, 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 I can imagine, uh, and, and I think, still, and still, if if need be, if we have to protect the president, and if I have to give my life, I would. Yeah. yeah. I think you know. Why is it so difficult for some people in the West to <clears throat> understand that? politics and life in general is extremely different in Central and South America. Why do you think, why do you believe it's, why do you believe there's a disconnect there? All of it. Like I said, that there's this double standard. More Americans get, get killed in officer involved shootings that than with regular crime. And uh, they want us to implement their textbook uh, solution. We did that and did not work. So right now we're implementing our own. I, I, and I, and I want to go back to that, right? The textbook solution did not work. Of course it did not work. It's it, 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 what, what happened when the U.S. exported its democracy to Iraq? What happened when the U.S. exported its democracy to Afghanistan? Those are very dangerous things that I just said. But yeah, what but, happened but, in those two but, situations? In the Middle East and Asia, that's different because Iran uh, had their, their Shah they got got wiped out and then they became a, a, a ruled by Sharia law and Afghanistan yes they have Sharia law but uh, like uh, the, Afga the Afghan system with the Saudi Arabian and the Qatari and Dubai system is not that different they rely on tribes on a tribal system so bringing uh, exporting democracy to a tribal system is uh, a new thing to them uh, democracy applies mainly on, on the Western uh, Hemisphere. And when the U.S. tried to help us and impose our Constitution, our Constitution is U.S. made, and it, it, it was imposed uh, to us in 1983. And then the, 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 the Washington consensus and uh, other things that they imposed on us did not work. So all the textbook solutions that we, we have been handed down and yeah, uh, been uh, strong armed to impose have not worked. So now we're doing our own solution. And I cannot tell you it has passed the time test in order to say, yeah, it, it, that was the solution. 
but in the short term and medium term, this has worked for us. Yeah, and then and, and you can see the data that this has been working. Yeah, no, and, and it, it, the 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 data speaks for itself. Um, and the alternative, right? You know the the alternative U.S. model that you said was imposed on the country of El Salvador um, was the what the results of that was a hundred people being murdered per day, right? Having one hundred and six homicides per capita. Isn't it interesting that the media wasn't talking about El Salvador when that was happening? No, not at all. It, it, at some point, it, 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 I don't know if it benefited the U.S. when a lot of the illegal immigrants started going to the U.S., which uh, to me, an illegal immigrant is uh, cheap work. Uh, so I don't know if that benefited them uh, w with that, even if they oppose uh, uh, illegal aliens and all, and all that, the, yet the... Uh, they rely on illegal alien work uh, to pick up uh, cabbages and vegetables and all that, and even doing handyman work and construction and uh, nanny work and cleaning work. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, but it, of course, it, it, you you could say the the multinational corporations they they benefit from illegal immigration tremendously. Uh, well, uh, news outlet here benefited from homicides. Uh, yeah. It is not the same as posting uh, or publishing on a newspaper a hundred dead, a hundred homicides uh, yesterday, and posting uh, five. Uh, Accident, car accident causes five people uh, injured. That, that, that's not the same. It, it, it doesn't rank as 100 homicides. As we are now in a boring country where more people die in car accidents than by homicides. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 insane. I I, I just you know I I, I find it interesting uh, where you have two solutions of which none are perfect, right? Um, one solution was leading to, you know, uh, 100, 100 deaths a day, right? And the other solution is, uh, you know, locking up uh, violent criminals, uh, getting them off the streets, and then obviously the, the net positive of that is drastic reduce, reducing yeah, but, but, but there are people that said what are what are you what are you guys doing in order to uh reform the, these people and when i when i'm interviewed and, and been asked that question i tell them that's not my problem that's another one uh, another person's problem my problem is tackle them down destroy them not kill them destroy their, their finances destroy their 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 their, 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 their corporations uh, or organizations, and in the past, uh, you can see the news. Not so long ago, uh, a group of gang members they filmed themselves with their cell phone, uh, chopping up eleven people. So, in my mind, how can you rehabilitate that? So, and you've said two things in this podcast, and and they, they they're sticking with me because they're horrific, right? Buses being set on fire with people inside alive, and gang members chopping up people, and posting it online, and posting it online. Um, so that's one alternative, right? Alternative number two is the crackdown. Um, and anyone that says that it could be a different, that it could, you know, go a different direction. My response to that is you're not from there. You're not from South America. You're not from Central America. Things don't work over there the way they work in the U.S. Right. Um, but that's my opinion. What would you what would your opinion be on that matter? If someone said there could be another way. I would say each country ha must have their own way. And let them let, let, let them try out and not impose textbook solution because the, the the same textbook solution will not work for Mexico, will not work for Guatemala, will not work for other Central American countries. Uh, each each solution has to be tailor made. Yeah, 
So I want to use the, the last five minutes or so to talk about um, Bitcoin and, and the Bitcoin standard. Do you believe, and you've been in Bitcoin since 2012, uh, I'm class of 2016. I can tell what adopting a Bitcoin standard has done to my life personally. Opti's in the background. Uh, you know, I know what it's done to him personally. Uh, you know, of course, I try to get my family members in it as well. And, you know, it's 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 amazing what happens when you start uh, living on a money that is deflationary rather than inflationary. Right. All of a sudden you have hope for a future. Do you believe that El Salvador adopting a Bitcoin standard has uh, has caused some of the benefits, has has inspired some people, has inspired some people with optimism uh, the way that they they wouldn't have or is this only due to Naim Bukele's uh, efforts on cracking down crime? Does, did, did, did Bitcoin play a role in any of this? Uh, yes and no. In security, I'm a Bitcoin maxi. I can tell you in security, it hasn't played any role. In giving us a spotlight and a place in, in, in the world, yes, has done. Um, many people have come here because of the BTC law. And Everyone is welcome here, except the ones with the whole agenda. You can, you can keep keep them. Um, uh, it is too early to say uh, the benefits of adopting the BTC standard as a nation state. In a personal level, you can see that uh, more clearly or uh, faster than than a nation state adopting Bitcoin. I would say give us 10 years and let's see how how it goes. What about adoption on the ground with with individuals? Uh, how, are you seeing that? You know, because that was, that was another counter to, counterpoint, right? Which is, you know, it's there's not really that much adoption there. What, what would your response uh, to, 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 to that be? Well, there have been projects like the one Deloitte has I don't know if you're familiar with with the law. Yes, of course. They had Bitcoin Beach, and they changed the name to Blink Wallet. And you have Mi Primer Bitcoin, which is my first Bitcoin, which is a NGO that teaches people Bitcoin. So, what started in El Sonte as Bitcoin Beach, now you have that as Bitcoin Jungle. You have Bitcoin Akasi in Africa. You have Bitcoin Brazil and other, and even in Philippines, you you have uh, what well, Galois started in El Sonte. So sparks are, are flying over to other countries and starting wildfires. Uh, other thing is are that uh, we're about 10 days into uh, the presidential and municipality and congressman election in Guatemala. And many of them have, have visited us. One, to show off how El Salvador is safe and that you can go to to the downtown where it was really dangerous back then and to see families having a great time there. And others have contacted me uh, regarding security and uh, Bitcoin. So about two weeks ago, I had a, a committee of congressmen here that are that are already in Congress and, and are being reelected. And they want to study the, the BTC legal tender law. And uh, for me, that's great. I do that uh, for free. Mm -hmm. I want Bitcoin to succeed. So uh, I was speaking to them and uh, Piero Cohen, who is the owner of Ibex Mercado, he had come up with a solution called Osmo Wallet and has integration with the banks and all that. And, and I'm telling this congressman, you have the product we wanted before BTC legal tender. All you need is declare or legalize BTC as legal tender. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, Alejandro, I know your time is valuable. You are you are doing some uh, inspiring work down in El Salvador. Uh, I know that you know some Bitcoiners in the community are uh, you know they have some opinions on that. But uh, as someone from Latin America, uh, I think what you guys did needed to be done. I don't think there was another way to do it. Um, well, I, I'm just a, a, a a sprocket in a in a in a big in a big machinery. Yeah, 
Yeah. So what you guys are doing is incredible. What Nayim Bukele uh, and his administration is doing is incredible. I am very, very hopeful. I see El Salvador is a shining light of hope in this clown world that we're living through right yeah, now. You, you, you should see what Satwise Janks is asking. Uh, let's pull. Okay, let's pull it up. Uh, please ask if cannabis legalization is possible there, like in Costa Rica's Bitcoin jungle. Well, uh, since 2015, I've been taking down, uh, taking that to Congress, and I've been uh, thrown to the rubbish bin every time I was uh, proposing that. And then, f for security reasons, I proposed that to the president because, like Pepe Mujica, uh, he said, uh, "I uh, legalizing marijuana is is not that good, but." Uh, losing people to narco is worse. So definitely the Pepe Mujica uh, solution that the state uh, is the the, the sole uh, seller of, of of marijuana, that was my proposal, but it got thrown to the rubbish bin. So I'll, I'll keep trying. Hey, but at least there's someone in government that is uh, that is on your that is on your side, Satwise. Anyways, Alejandro, it's it's been an honor. Thank you so much for joining us today on Simply Bitcoin. Uh, thank you very much. And a big shout out to Extemos. He's a Salvadorian who's watching us. And also, since, since this, this podcast is uh, 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 pro, uh, sponsored by Swan, a big shout out to Corey Klipstein. Yeah. He's a great guy. And a big shout out to Ray Youssef. Uh, he didn't uh commit into shit coining and we need people like Corey and ray and we need to clean up the world uh, uh of shit coiners and like i said shit coiners and woke agenda people here are not welcome <laughs> amen to that alejandro thank you so much guys thank you so much for tuning into another oh. episode oh go ahead go ahead yeah another shout out for for nikki and james there uh, we go big friends of mine from new zealand they came here without knowing the country. Uh, they sold their stuff in New Zealand, came here, didn't know nothing about Spanish. Now they speak Spanish and they are great persons. Yeah, no, and I, I think I, I, I think I, you guys should definitely come on the show. Alejandro, when I go to El Salvador, I would love to to meet with you, have a beer with you, man. Uh, thank you so much. I'll hit you up on Twitter. Uh, we, sure. Opti and I, we have this joke, and I would love to, to tell you about it. We're like, we're going to try to hold it down in the U.S., but if all, if all else fails here, simply Bitcoin is moving to El Salvador. <laughs> Right, yes. um, the land, um, the land of I, I actual it, freedom. I hope El Salvador becomes a, 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 a Silicon Valley of Bitcoin. <laughs> Opti's pulling up, pulling it up. Simplemente. <laughs> Simplemente Bitcoin. Simplemente Bitcoin. Oh, exactly. Exactly. All right, all right, Alejandro. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so for much having. for tuning in to another episode of. Alejandro, hang out, hang out in the back. I want to, I want to talk to you for a sec, uh, guys. Thank you so much for tuning into another episode of Simply Bitcoin IRL. Uh, I absolutely love this conversation with Alejandro. If you guys like the show, you know what to do: smash that like button, consider subscribing if you feel like we provided you value, and we'll see you tomorrow on the live show, twelve fifteen p.m. Eastern Standard Time, for another episode of Simply Bitcoin Live. 